Welcome, Stevie Nicks. Can I start by saying you look marvelous? Thank you. From the very beginning, how did, how did you get involved into music? I did have this amazing granddad who uh, played music and wrote songs and played amazing mouth harp and harmonica. And one day he, he went and bought a whole bunch of CDs, not CDs, um, 45s. 45s for me from a record store that was going out of business and brought them all to our house in El Paso, Texas. And he and I sat for days and played all of these songs. And that's when I first heard Like the Everly Brothers, and that's when I first heard Buddy Holly, and all the kind of rockabilly acts, you know. I love Ricky Nelson. Me too. There's a song, It's Late. Can you tell me what that song means to you? Well, that was one of those 45s that my granddad brought to my house. And so he and I actually sang It's Late. So that was fourth grade. You sang in harmony with him? Uh -huh. And that was awesome. So in, I never took a music class in high school, ever. I was never in chorus, Were you never took a, never in drama, uh -huh. even though I'm incredibly dramatic, never took drama, didn't want to, I just wanted to do my own thing. Were you playing piano at home or? Nope, I was playing guitar though. I learned to, I, I, I got my first guitar when I was 15 and a half and it was a little Goya that my right. parents bought for my guitar teacher. And I, you know, took eight, eight lessons, and he went to Spain, and I, I got the guitar, and that's all the guitar lessons I took. And that was, you know, those eight lessons made it possible for me to write Landslide and Goldust Woman and, you know, Can all you the... Can give me uh, the name of that teacher? He's, like, long gone. <laughs> he's, he's in Spain somewhere. Saying, I bet he's I'm there now. I'm just saying, if the guy taught you eight lessons and you got Landslide... Right. But it was cla and it was classical, so I actually, you know, learned chords and also a little bit of, a little bit of real classical guitar. What's the first song you ever wrote? Well, when I was 15 and a half, this, the guy from, the, the classical guitar the, teacher. The guy who gave you the Goya. Right. And I wrote my first song on my 16th birthday. And uh, it was called, I've Loved and I've Lost. And I only can remember one verse of it. I don't, I don't know if there was a chorus or, but this is after a passionate three week relationship. I was gonna say you were 16. I was How much, no, yeah. I was not even 16. Yeah. You know, I was 15 and a half and three fourths. And um, so it went, um, I've loved and I've lost and I'm sad but not blue. I once loved a boy who was wonderful and true, but he loved another before he loved me. And I knew he still wanted her. Twas easy to see. That's all I remember. But that was my first song. And then the bridge went, Rhiannon. Lindsay and I were a little bit on the rocks when we joined Fleetwood Mac. And then we kind of decided to kind of stay together because we, we knew we had a good thing going. And we, didn't, we knew if we were like breaking up, that would kind of wreck the band. It's late. We gotta get on home. It's late. We've been gone too long. Too bad. We should have checked our time. Can't fall. We don't spend every dime. It's late. We're about to run out of gas. It's late. My parents, I think, were very aware from the very beginning that music was going to be my life. So they weren't afraid of you being a musician? No. no. And they could have been because my grandfather's life wasn't very happy. He did not have a happy musician's life. He was a musician slash pool player. And he just rode the rails and traveled all over the United States and played great pool. And that's how he kind of supported himself. But he really wanted to, be, to, to make it in the music business, and he didn't. And he was fairly bitter about it, I think. When I showed him the Buckingham Knicks album, he, I saw for a second a look cross his face. He, he that wasn't was like, happy for you. That it was like, she's going she's gonna to make it, and I didn't. But it went away very fast. But right. I saw it, because I was very close to him. But I saw it. And, you know, that's how we are. We, you know, we that love music and want to be in the music business, it's like, you know, yeah, if you don't make it and you're, eight, you know, you're 80 years old, and that's when I showed him the, the right. record, you're like, well, that's great, and I'm really happy for you, but my life has just been a total bummer. You're talking about Lindsey Buckingham and those years, and let me just, I want to hold up the album, Buckingham Nicks from, this is a, that period. And 1973. I, 73, and I just, this was, was this a big seller? Not really. But, you know, yeah, I but it what became a real collector's item. It you would know? have sold a lot more if you guys had switched positions on the cover. I know, I th I'm thinking that you probably would be right. Well, let me ask this. When you joined 
Fleetwood Mac. What was the state of the band when you joined? Well, um, so they called on New Year's Eve 74. So January 1st, 1975, Lindsay and I ran out to Tower Records and bought all the, spent our last pennies on all the Fleetwood Mac records, which were several. And uh, we listened to all of them back to front, really, to decide whether or not we thought that we could actually add something to this band. And I actually thought that we could. I said, you know, I think it's a very mystical side to this band. And did everybody welcome you in with open arms as they were happy to have you in? or? Well, we, uh, two days later, we went to dinner in Venice to some Mexican food place, and we met all of us. And, I, and then I've been told by the rest of the band that it all hinged on whether Christine McPhee liked me or not. So it was all Chris's decision. And what happened was, was that when I met Christine McPhee, I absolutely adored her. She was funny and English and that total dry wit. Mm -hmm. And she was like an amazing piano player and an amazing singer. And from what Mick and John says, she said, I love this girl. She's, she's not arrogant. She's, she's sweet and she's loving and she loves us and she loves our music. And I think that it's going to be great. So we went into rehearsal three days later Went, in, went into the studio a month later, and by the end of that summer, six months later, Lindsay and I together were a combined millionaire. What did it change in your life? Did it... Everything. The first thing I did was move out of my apartment with Lindsay yeah. and into an apartment by myself. And then oh. Lindsay moved in with me about five months later. And so it, it was, you know, I mean, Lindsay and I were a little bit on the rocks when we joined Fleetwood Mac. And then we kind of decided to kind of stay together because we, we knew we had a good thing going. And we, didn't, we knew if we were, like, breaking up, that would kind of wreck the band. Okay, you, so we stayed together for, like, a year. And then we broke up in 1976. When you made rumors, there's all kinds of relationships going on. And, and how is it when you're in a band making an album, does that make it tremendously more difficult? Or did that add something to it? Oh, it totally added something to it. But it was hard. Wait a second. Now, you broke up. And now you have to keep working. Right. So now you show up the next day, and he's in the studio, and you say, hi, how you doing? It was a very cold situation. But, but mind you, Christine and John were also breaking up, and they were married. And Mick was kind of on the rocks with his wife, too. And he, but Mick had two little girls. So he actually had children, which even made it worse. So everybody in the band was breaking up. So it was almost kind of like, well, it totally sucks. So, but, you know, but I'm not quitting. And, you know, Lindsay's like, I'm not quitting. And Mick and John and Christina are, I'm not quitting. So we just kind of rose above it. From st you, you give up a lot to be a rock star. Yeah. What is it you give up? Is, it, is there things well, you feel I made, like... Well, you know, I made a choice a long time ago that I didn't want to be married. Because why? I don't like to be told what to do. And there's been a few men in my life who actually dug my life. Now, that's great, but those men are rare. Um, so I'm not lonely. I made the choice. I made the choice not to have children or a husband because I wanted to be an artist, and I wanted to pursue being an artist forever and always. I didn't want to have to stop to do other things. And at 60 years old, I'm very happy that I did that. Someday I will have the time to go, you know, rent a house on a cliff by the ocean with a typewriter since I don't have a computer. You type your poetry on a typewriter? Mm -hmm. And I write in a journal. I don't have a computer. I don't like them and I don't, I'm too old school. I can't go so there. You don't have a computer? No. And I don't have Wait. a cell phone. So who have, who, who have I been emailing back and forth? My assistant Karen. Oh. Who if she thinks the email is important enough she'll print it out for me. Okay well some of the things that but were said were very personal. I <laughs> but okay. All right. You have fans who go crazy. I mean I, I, crazy, I know they do. Cra I mean, and then of course there'll be that six foot five dude that will be dressed in white lace and high boots. You know, it's like I mean, my fans. That's Mick Fleetwood you're talking about. No, it's not. <laughs> it can be him though, uh, but but it's you know it's like I, I the people that you know there's just like an amazing bunch of completely different people that just you know there's Night of a Thousand Stevies there's you know which of course I've never really been to but. 
But it goes and on every year. Dress, t t explain what the Night of a Thousand Stevies Everybody is. Everybody dresses at me, as me and goes to this big, huge party. As me, as me in some part of my life, you know, whether it was the very beginning of Fleetwood Mac or whether, you know, the different clothes I've worn or they find a picture of me that so they like. and like they Elvis, just, there's an early Stevie? Yes, there's ladies. a middle and there's, yes. And they go and they have this big, huge, massive karaoke concert, you know, where there's just gazillions of people. And they just have a ball. It's like a big Halloween party every year. Wait, can, can we, you know, very briefly, can, can you just, you can use this as an opportunity to maybe set people straight. Like I say, some people see it as, you know, Stevie Nicks is very spiritual, but some people take it and think, oh, she's a witch. She has these powers and things, which I always laugh it off. Like, I think it's a joke, but there's people who really seriously... That all came from Rhiannon, and that's completely crazy, and I have told everybody a million times, I love Halloween, I love dressing up as a witch, but I am not a witch. That's nuts. Um, but I love looking like one. But the, the song Rhiannon, can you explain She's a that? Welsh goddess, though. She's the, in the story of Rhiannon, she's a Welsh goddess, and she's a queen. She's Queen Rhiannon, and she is not, there's nothing witchy about her. Right. She's just a beautiful, really good goddess. How do they, why do they, they, they just jump from I there? I think that because in the very beginning before I'd read the books, I, I just heard the name and I loved it. So I decided that, I knew it was Welsh, so I decided that she was going to be a Welsh witch. So I would say this is a song about a Welsh witch. But I am not a witch. Do you have a name like, okay, there's the Godfather of Soul or the Queen of right. Soul? Or, or, did, you know people... what I just like to be? I just wanted to be a, the, you know, there's a Buffalo Springfield song called Rock and Roll Woman. You just so want to be a rock and roll woman? I just want to be a rock and roll woman, and that's all I ever wanted to be.